Please tell me they're wearing mini mice astronaut suits. <laughs> I wish. I know. Greetings, Earthlings. What better way to take your mind off the madness in the world than by sheltering in place with me, Drew Duglin? This is Prescription Sound, episode 19, and we have some fun lined up today. I speak with behavioral neuroscience expert Amanda Roberts, who has been involved with the NASA mission to study mice in outer space as a way to ultimately improve human health out there as well as back here on Earth. So let's dig in and find out how Amanda's background at Scripps Research suddenly led to the collaboration of a lifetime. I actually uh, was a psychobiology major as an undergrad, mostly interested in like animal behavior and how the brain manipulated behavior. And in fact, it was funny because my old graduate advisor just recently found my, uh, my letter that I sent to graduate school, you know, about what I wanted to do when I grow up, you know. And it was very funny and very idealistic about, you know, really understanding how the brain, you know, mediates behavior and everything. And then when I did go to graduate school, I, because I was in a department that was funded by NIH, then it was all about now using animal behavior to actually model human diseases. Mm. Most of my previous work was in um, alcohol and drug addiction and genetics and pharmacology and neuroscience kind of all combined. So when I came here, I came to also do drug and alcohol research as a postdoc. And it was right at the time when everybody was starting to make mutant mice. And then they would just have these mice and they would look at them and say, now what? <laughs> you know what? Yeah. So that was sort of the, um, you know, what's wrong with my mouse generation of people needing somebody who understood, you know, animal behavior. So at first it was really fun just collaborating, but I, I was like, when am I ever going to do my own research if I'm constantly, you know, <laughs> helping everybody else with theirs? And so it dawned on me that it would be a perfect core resource to offer people is basically a, a mouse testing core. And so that's kind of where that all came from. Yeah, it must have been just so fascinating with the range of projects and all the different people you're working with. And I've used the core in my lab research, and it just has been such an invaluable resource. So it's, um, it's just really great to have that on campus. Right now, I have been so excited to talk to you about this work. But before we get into the actual nuts and bolts um, of the study, I'm very curious on how you actually got involved with working with NASA in the first place. I'm assuming the um, top secret government officials didn't just come knocking on your door and ask for a collaboration. I know. It's funny. Um, yeah, it was actually a really kind of a strange way. So what happens is um, Taconic is one of the biggest suppliers of laboratory rodents, right? And they're the ones that supply the um, NASA missions. And it turns out that I was talking to Taconic for a project I was working on for UCSD Alzheimer's lab. And she said, you know, we're looking for somebody on the West Coast who has a, an animal facility and who could potentially help us with these missions because the animals land in Long Beach. Uh -huh. Well, they don't land in Long Beach. In fact, they land wherever they land in the ocean. But they all come shunted through Long Beach, and they needed to find a lab in the general area where they could do... Mostly, they were just looking for a place to do dissections. But then, when it sort of became obvious that we could also do some physiological and behavioral experiments with the animals, then it was even more exciting. And so we really got this kind of thing going. So with this mission that you were involved with, what was the overall idea behind it? Like what was the study and, and what was the, the goal? What were people trying to find out? One of the main things is that microgravity has been considered a model of accelerated aging. So the idea is we can use microgravity to see what happens with aging and then ultimately how we can maybe reverse or affect these things, you know, and, and learn more about that process. But I have to say that most of the people that I worked with were way more excited about just the idea of understanding humans in space mm. for longer times at the International Space Station. I see. And with the accelerated aging, is that musculoskeletal? So the idea that you lose a lot of muscle density and, and bone density in the microgravity and a lot of people who are uh, with advanced age suffer from that also. 
Yeah, that's one of the things. I mean, basically every physiological system seems to be affected. So one of the big ones they've been looking at quite a lot is the immune system. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, not only just direct effects of microgravity on immune function and immune cells, but also just the fact that they've shown that the conditions at the International Space Station are associated with increased cortisol in humans and corticosterone in rodents. And that's an immunosuppressive, you know, stress hormone. So the immune system's been a big one. Cardiovascular is huge. In fact, we had um, two labs that were here doing the dissections that were dissecting out individual arteries and veins and things to study. And then um, the nervous system. So the brain, the eyes, spinal cord, I mean, just everything. So, oh, uh, microbiome. Oh, really? It's a huge yeah. one, yeah, God, because God they really they think that you know the microbiome's affected. And think about it you you can imagine that our um, our skin microbiome would be hugely impacted too with microgravity. So all these things are kind of in people's minds. With such an ambitious mission, the mice need habitats specially designed for the conditions of microgravity. Amanda details the procedure prior to launch as well as the excitement once the mice came back to Earth. The mice got shipped from Taconic to the Kennedy Space Center um, after they get microchipped and everything. So I spent, you know, maybe five days there, and I actually helped with the dissections. Um, They do, like, baseline dissections. Then you've got your three groups, your vivarium controls, your habitat controls, and then your internet, you know, space station mice. And then with those, within those, you've got two ages. By the way, interestingly, females. And the okay. main reason is that they, they don't smell as bad as males. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Isn't that funny? So you never know when the bias is going to come in research, but in that case, that was a funny one. <laughs> so anyway, so the idea behind the habitat control is what they've been worried about is um, there's, it's pretty noisy, because of the fans to do the, the air supply and to keep the, you know, to go through our charcoal filter and all that kind of stuff that they've got in there. Um, so they're, they were concerned that the habitat itself could cause some distress to the animals. And so that was one of our main things was to compare the habitat controls to the vivarium controls, which were mice just housed in normal mouse cages. And in fact, we really didn't see anything major. I mean, I think we had a couple of tests where we saw some differences, but but not too bad. And that was good. They were happy about that. So there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of controls in different groups. So basically on that payload were the um, the mice that were going up there, um, including mice that were actually going to get dissected up in space by the astronauts. Okay. And then what we call the recovery mice were the ones that were then sent back down. I see. So we've done two missions so far. So the first one that we did, the mice were basically dissected within about 48 hours of returning, um, even maybe less, maybe 36 hours of returning. So I was only able to do just a few little basic behavioral tests on them. But this, this last one, they'd been up for 30 days, which is kind of their standard. And then they actually were recovered for 21 days before okay. we did the dissections. So that was very cool because we could actually, there were some tests that we could do repeatedly across that 21-day period. So the other thing that was amazing was on my end. So, okay, so I, I, go, to, I go to Florida, come back, and now I'm waiting, you know, 30 days, right, for mm-hmm. the mice. And so then this was exactly the time when they were, they were being threatened with a potential hurricane Ooh. in Florida. And normally what they would have done was, they would have kept some of the animals in Florida and dissected them there. But they freaked out thinking they were going to have to close down the Kennedy Space Center. And so they put all the animals, including animals in the habitat controls, which they don't, NASA does not let those habitats out of their sight. So they put them on this, the biggest FedEx truck I have ever seen in my life with two pallets with like, you know, four cages, temperature controlled, light controlled, and they drove across the country. Now, when NASA arrives with the space mice, that is amazing. So they come just in a basic van, like it, like a rental van. But then they, they, it's like men in black. Like they, they're, they're, they, they're wearing like dark glasses, it seems like, you know. 
and you're not. I'm allowed surprised to touch you can anything. remember anything. They usually wipe your memory. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, in fact, it's always funny because they always come at the weirdest time. So the first one, they came at like, you know, two in the morning. So it does feel very wow. ethereal because, you know, you're going through this thing. So they put it on this wheeled contraption, this this huge, it's got the transporter inside, like almost like an R2-D2 looking kind of robot type thing. And they wheel that into the lab, into our lab. And then they've got the NASA vet and our vet. And several other people are all in this room, okay? And I have to open up the thing. They have to watch me do everything because they can't touch this without them seeing me. Then I put my arm in, down in blindly because you can't see anything and grab a mouse, pull it out, put it on my hand, let the vets look at the mouse, then put it into a new cage. Put my arm in again, pull out another mouse. <laughs> put them in. So that was how the mice end up coming out of these things here. It seems to take hours because then NASA has to do a bunch of decommissioning, you know, kind of like power down of these transporters. And then they pack them back up into the van and they drive them back up to um, like Mountain View, like Bay Area. So that was how that all went. And then pretty much we, we immediately started testing them because we wanted to test them, you know, right away for certain things. You know, it's interesting because I've seen videos of the mice in space. And um, it's interesting because what, what seems to happen is as the mice sort of acclimate to the microgravity, they develop this sort of um, circling. They do a lot of like running, almost like they're running on a wheel, but they're running around the habitat. And in my mind, I want to say that they're actually doing that as a self-regulation, right? As a kind of a grounding and, and to kind of get their vestibular system to sort of like realize that there's ground under their feet, you know, because oh, if they, they can actually sort of, you know, touch the sides of the cage as they're, as they're cruising around. So uh, it's kind of interesting. So they do, they actually, and I think that that could be very interesting with regard to some of the things that we found with them after they came home, which is their motor systems weren't as as badly affected as we, I sort of thought they would be, especially these C-57 mice. They looked amazingly good. They weren't. The funny thing was the previous mission that was the Balb C mice, the mice came back and they were really, they, you could tell they felt so heavy, like they were just like really, you know, like kind of low, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the C-57 mice, when they came back, they, they didn't show that behavior at all, which I thought was interesting. And I was thinking, well, maybe they're doing more running around, you know, up in space. So, And these would just be uh, two different strains of what we'd call wild type mice. And I was wondering if there was any mice that were kind of genetically altered going up there. Yes. So these were just wild type mice, but the mission right after ours, they sent mice that are called mighty mice and they have, and I can't remember the mutation now, but basically it's, they have either increased muscle mass or they have, they have a mutation that basically allows them to be, they think stronger. And so I, I haven't seen any of the results from that yet, but I would be super interested to see, you know, what they ultimately found, you know? Yeah. I think I've heard of these mice. I think they, um, was it the myostatin gene, the gene oh, that usually can, yeah. uh, prevents you gaining too much muscle because it would be like a waste of energy? They guess they have that knocked out and it <laughs> leads to them looking like bodybuilders. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned some of these biological systems. So what was it exactly that you were studying when the mice did come back to Earth? And from your analysis so far, what are the, some of the, the findings you found from space? When, we, when they first came back, um, they definitely had some decreased grip strength, so strength, which makes total sense, right? You're, yeah. you know, you're in my... Uh, but it actually recovered very well across those three weeks. They showed decreased activity and speed um, in motor tests, you know, locomotor, like movement tests. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, those really recovered as well. Um, one of the things that was interesting is that definitely the older mice were more affected than the younger mice. I see. Okay. So that was interesting, and, and that was sort of hypothesized, you know. But what was interesting to me was that the older mice were not that old. I mean, they called them older, but they were what they were nine to eleven months, hmm. which really is just kind of a middle age, actually. So I was making jokes about it. I'm like, oh, no, you know, it's not really older. It's, you know, middle age. But, of course, that probably corresponds to the older astronauts anyway, so that's probably okay. 
but anyway, we found that in more complicated learning and memory tests, there were impairments in the older flight mice, we call them flight mice, um, compared to the vivarium and habitat controls, even at the end, you know, even by the end time. So by, you know, maybe a couple of days before we did the dissections, we did a complicated learning and memory test, and there were um, deficits in the older flight mice, um, but not in the younger flight mice. So that goes, that kind of goes with the concept that maybe there is this idea of accelerated aging. And then the other thing that we found that was also was very interesting was that we found um, impaired sociability in the older flight mice. So they didn't really they weren't as interested in spending time with another mouse versus inanimate object, basically. I mean, are there any crazy theories then on how the effect of gravity controls our just ability to learn and remember and be social? I think it's that if you have sort of an accelerated aging process and you, not that you're going to necessarily have things like plaques and tangles in the brain or anything like that, not that you've created like an Alzheimer's state or anything, but the neurochemistry clearly is being affected. And so, for example, the social behavioral um, deficit could be related to the, um, you know, excitatory amino acid systems and, and dopamine and noradrenaline and all these other ones you know, that are involved in that kind of behavior are probably impacted by spaceflight. And whether that is permanent or not is a mystery and a question still, because we didn't get to obviously track them for any longer than a three-week period. I know in humans, you know, when they come back from space, they do show some cognitive hmm. issues at first, but they do, they do, you know, resolve. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask that, and I mm -hmm. wondered if that differed between astronauts of different age. I mean, I don't know what the age range is of astronauts going up. I forget what the, the maximum age in space may be in the early 50s or late 40s, but it takes like 10 plus years to train to be yeah, an astronaut. Sure. So, you have, so roughly middle age, which kind of, you know, does correspond to the older I know, animal. is there like a threshold there we should be aware of? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know that's what you wonder about too. And, you know, the other thing though is they did a study where they sent pregnant mice up into oh. up to the space station, but I haven't seen any of the data being published yet on that. So, because that you can imagine could be very problematic is, is development in space, right? So I think the younger group, that three to five months old group of mice, which is, you know, young adult, seems like a very resistant situation. And I'd be interested to know if they've really done this with the, with the astronauts and looked at their age related to all the symptoms that they end up showing. For a colossal project like this, the organization took months with so many people and groups involved. The multidisciplinary support staff on hand were critical to the success of the launch and ensured that the study met the highest standards of scientific rigor and animal care. You're looking at a coordinated effort like I have never seen in my life. I mean, the number of people and situations that were involved in this was beyond anything I've been involved with before. So to be honest, I've only actually worked with a couple of directly NASA people. I've worked with a lot of people that are from BioServe Space Technologies. So BioServe Space Technologies are re is responsible for um, kind of setting up the actual system to house the animals. And then the International Space Station national lab, basically. So that's a lab. So they're a big player. And then NASA. And then, of course, on top of that, we've got SpaceX. I, know, I was just about to ask. Yeah. You know, since we, we recently had the Falcon 9 rocket launch. So I was wondering with all those players, whether yeah. um, you had input yeah. from SpaceX. And, and in fact, you know, the cool thing is it wasn't the same one, but a Falcon 9 also took our mice up to space in a dragon oh, compartment no that actually looks from the outside very similar to the one that the humans were just in. You know, and one of the guys um, had gone over to SpaceX and, you know, had brought back a bunch of SpaceX swag for everybody. <laughs> yeah. So I've got my hat and, you know. Um, I want to so, see you around the Institute wearing that next time we can all be together. I wore it this last weekend. It was fun. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so it was, it was really, really cool to see how, how much organization goes into just that one kind of experiment, how much went into that and how crazy it was. Now, speaking of all the other groups that are involved with these space missions, didn't you mention to me before that lots of other uh, vested interests want to be sending uh, things into space on these missions? Yeah, so on our mission, um, Goodyear Tire Company sent silica and rubber 
um, because they, I guess, sil- I guess they need silica in their tires to get good traction, but yet it's hard to mute, to fuse silica and rubber. And so they were they were doing experiments up there to see whether at microgravity whether you'd get like a better silica like morphology would be different. Doing chemistry in space is different, so they're they're trying to make use of that to look at different materials. So there's a lot of interest in materials. Another one of the ones that was going on in our mission was they took a bioprinter and were printing out cardiac like tissue. Damn. I know, and they were, and then they're leaving it up there, and then they're going to bring it back when they bring back, you know, uh, the next load to analyze it. And they just recently sent worms, nematodes, um, and they were actually doing some behavioral testing of the nematodes, which I thought was hilarious. And then the other, they do a lot of educational types of things. So Nickelodeon had slime in space. I mean, it's kind of fun. You can actually find videos of the astronauts, like, teaching, like, what happens if I throw this up in the air, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, what happens to slime? So that's just kind of an example. But I think on our mission, there was, like, 15 different experimental entities got sent up. Yeah, have this amazing visual of the astronauts floating down the space station and what's behind door number one? Oh, it's tires. What's behind door number two? Worms, mice, slime, organs. I know. I know. I mean, can you imagine being one of these astronauts and they have to do these experiments? In fact, it was it was funny because I saw the presentation that they were given for their dissections. They're, they come from different fields of study, obviously, these astronauts do, yeah. right? So, you know, they're not necessarily familiar with doing dissections on mice (laughs) or, you know, or printing out cardiac material or whatever, you know. So it must be really interesting for them. It's like, geez, what do we have in this load, you know? Now, I was curious when you're not looking at uh, mouse behavior and down in the animal core, uh, what are some of your other hobbies and passions? Well, I'm a long-term runner. And so I spend a lot of time running, although as I'm getting older, it's getting a little bit more painful <laughs> on my knees. Um, but when I turned 50 a few years ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to um, train for a 50K. I didn't do 50 miles, I did 50K uh, run at Catalina Island. Oh, cool. So while I was trained for that, I decided, you know what? A marathon is nothing. So I went and did a marathon in Huntington Beach, and I super qualified for the Boston Marathon. So I'm like, oh, well, now I've got to do the Boston Marathon, you know. So um, that was a couple years ago, and it was actually, yeah, thank you. It was a it was a great experience. So running is a big one. Um, Cooking is a really big one. I I find that when I get home from a long day at work, I just love being in the kitchen. Um, and so, even, you know, it's funny because everybody's talking about doing more cooking now that we're all inside more and, and not eating out. But for me, I, I don't eat out that often anyway. So sure. cooking, you know, has kind of stayed the same. Although I have, I did do the sourdough starter, you know, had to, had to go that route with everybody else. <laughs> oh, and actually, I wanted to just throw a, a plug in as well. You're very involved with the uh, Homestart charity here in San Diego. I yeah. Just... So I'm, I'm a faculty advisor for Scripps Assist here on campus, which is our sort of institute's volunteer and, you know, do good kind of group. And uh, so every year I do the Home Start Christmas Adopt a Family and Toy Drive. And then also um, for our annual craft fair, I do a lot of the, you know, getting all the donations for the prizes and things like that. So the other thing I should just make a quick plug for is is that one of my goals in life is that I love being an educator. And so I do a lot of internships and I go to the high, or I Zoom to the high schools and a lot of lectures and things like that to try to get especially underrepresented kids into into biology. Kind of my passion, yeah. Yeah, we really need more of that. So big statement of gratitude to you for for doing that. And um, yeah, for the toy drive, I mean, it's been so enriching to be involved with. So thanks for doing all that organization. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm sure we'll keep going on that for sure. Yeah. So. Well, that, I guess, brings me to my final roundup question, which I ask all my guests, as you're probably aware if you listen. <laughs> so you've probably been primed. But yeah, if you could give one piece of advice or your worldly wisdom to anybody in um, kind of any part of life, work, career, progression, you know, life and health, self-improvement, what do you think it would be and why? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, I have thought about it because I've, I have listened to other people's answers <laughs> over the time. And I think 
something that I thought that I really apply to life in all my domain, you know, in all the domains of life, is really always taking on a challenge and not mm. shying away from things that are scary. I just find that you don't grow unless you stretch. The most rewarding things that have happened to me have been things that I could have easily just said, no, it's okay. Even the project we're talking about now, mm -hmm. you know, I could have said, oh my gosh, that just seems way too intense and way too much work and way too, but no, you know, I mean, I jumped at it because, oh my gosh, I mean, of course, most people would, but, you know, other things in my life, I have put myself out of comfort for sure, and have always found, I mean, it doesn't always work out great, but I always grow, and I always learn, and it sort of keeps you that lifelong learner um, that I think we all want to be. So that would be it. I would be embrace challenge. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't achieve the goal, just having it there to aim at and learning along the way is often just as valuable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Maybe some of the best advice we've had there on the show, very inspiring. A big thank you to Amanda for joining me today in recounting those wild tales. I can't wait to see where NASA goes with these missions. And for the curious among you, in the show notes, I'll put some links to learn more about the work. Remember to follow us on all the usual social media hangouts. And if you've had a good time, please remember to share the episode, subscribe, and leave us a generous review. It really would make our day. So until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay strong, and be kind.